7. Muddy Morality What one generation fights with inconsistency, the next generation tolerates. Finally, the third generation endorses and embraces and the fourth generation propagates and promotes point one Dr. Dennis Coral. Modern version producers claim that they simply want the English Bible to be easier to read. Why then do they deliberately lend a helping hand to the sodomite agenda in our laissez-faire society? Absolute standards are a necessity, especially in areas of intimacy. Many Christians incorrectly limit the definition of fornication as intimate relations between two people who are not married to each other. However, the biblical definition of fornication has remained unchanged. The Bible defines fornication as premarital relations. Flee fornication. With this definition in mind, there can be no doubt concerning the intent of the warning conveyed by the next verse. God warns people to flee, run away, when tempted to become intimately involved outside the bounds of marriage. KJB 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 Flee fornication Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that cometh fornication sinneth against his own body. God does not need to make the meaning of this verse any clearer for those who truly desire to stay true to Him. Any intimate relationships outside of marriage are clearly prohibited. In fact, God warns people to turn and run from such dangerous and ungodly relationships. Modern version updating certainly does not serve to make this truth plainer. In fact, modern Bibles obscure the clarity. What warning do these versions communicate? Neve. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Rather than using the more precise wording of the KJB flee fornication, the new versions tell the reader to flee from something undefined. Immorality carries with it no precise definition of right or wrong. Thus, each person defines the ambiguous terminology for himself functioning as his own god. Society has been increasingly redefining the meaning of immorality. Without an absolute authority or standard, morality transforms as cultural views waver. As man's fear of the Lord diminishes, acts once deemed immoral by society will become acceptable, lest one appear judgmental. However, the true Bible's use of fornication leaves no room for debate. The meaning is fixed and unchanging. As our permissive society continues to degrade, the terminology used by the modern versions will continue to be redefined. Society has turned away from God and limited the definition of fornication to include only the most shocking actions beyond the marital boundaries. With such a mindset, many would claim that an intimate relationship between two consenting adults is not immoral. A person holding this point of view and looking to the NIV for guidance might then justify actions deemed sinful in the true word of God. Because of the NIV's changes, they could even be convinced that these actions do not fall within the realm of God's condemnation. Other individuals might limit their definition of immorality to same-sex encounters. However, the Bible warns of this type of perversion elsewhere. Still others might limit the bounds of to those actions which involve children or bestiality. However, the Bible's definition of fornication carries no such man-made limitation. In the preceding verse, the NIV uses vague terminology which necessitates the search for a more precise and progressively more permissive definition. In contrast, the KJB's use of the word fornication in the same verse provides man with an absolute moral standard by which to judge standards of intimacy. Christians have allowed situational ethics and the all-truth-is-relative philosophy to infiltrate the church. Sinful man wants no absolutes. God's word, however, provides us absolute standards by which to judge our actions and determine whether they are right or sinful. American courts have judged that even pornography is a protected constitutional right handed down by the forefathers of our nation. Complete and total insanity. When there is no absolute standard by which to discern the morality of actions, the situation of man is precisely that of Israel when it had no leadership. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes, Judges 17 verse 6. Presidents have issued executive orders forbidding homosexuals from being discharged from the military, all in the name of being open-minded and accepting of alternative lifestyles. Currently, sodomites, using biblical terminology, can openly serve in the military. States are now recognizing same-sex marriages. 
We have even had a president who claimed to be innocent of the legal definition of having intimate relations with a young woman other than his wife. Man does not need to be his own judge as to what is right and wrong. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Romans 3 verse 4 The body is not for fornication. God warns us in the King James Bible to flee from potentially damaging situations involving our bodies. Our bodies are not to be involved in any relationship outside the marriage bond. KJB 1 Corinthians 6 verse 13 meets for the belly, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God's word is very clear and precise. God's warnings are not limited to those acts which the minority or even the majority may consider offensive or immoral. The body is not for fornication. Period. Fornication involves premarital relations and adultery post-martial relations. The warning from the King James Bible, thus from God, encompasses more than acts which people deem repugnant or perverted. This warning in the KJB, instead, includes all physical intimacy outside of marriage. Not so in the NIV. Neve. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 13 Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Once again, the modern version has diluted and changed God's clear warning. Some decent people might limit their definition of immorality to include only the acts of sodomites and pedophiles while justifying other deviant behavior. Carnal Christians are looking for any opportunity to avoid responsibility for their sinful actions. Satan, always willing to assist them, allows the modern Bibles to do his bidding. Fornication eliminated. Consider the following verse from the King James Bible which contains a clear warning concerning the sin of fornication. KJB. Romans 1 verse 29 being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. Satan facilitates the sinner by allowing him to commit his sin with no direct condemnation from the modern versions. Satan accomplishes this by providing a Bible that does not directly mention the sin. In this verse in the NIV, the word fornication is removed completely without being replaced. Fornication's condemnation must be eliminated in order to create a progressively desensitized and depraved culture. This is Satan's ultimate goal. Such unchecked vices have caused the greatest and most powerful societies to crumble from within. Neve. Romans 1 verse 29 They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips. As we have seen, fornication is changed elsewhere in the modern versions and completely ripped out of Romans chapter 1. Why do you think this has happened? No wonder Christians frequently have no greater conviction than the lost concerning the things viewed as entertainment. Television programs now blatantly celebrate and esteem even the most perverse and explicit types of inappropriate behavior. People should follow Joseph's example of fleeing fornication. Popular culture now claims that sodomites are born that way. Thus, they had and have no choice. Historically, homosexuality was characterized as an individual's sexual preference. Since political correctness now teaches that the individual had no choice, one's preference has been redefined as his or her sexual orientation. Schools are even teaching that a certain percentage of the population is born with a sexual orientation toward the same gender. The military provides and sometimes requires homosexuality sensitivity training courses. The don't ask, don't tell military policy is a direct result of a society gone crazy. Even the medical profession has been unable to withstand the sodomite agenda. The American Psychological Association has yielded to external pressure and claimed that the sodomite, KJB word, cannot help himself. A Montgomery Advertiser article from the early 1990s clearly reveals the current trend. The American Psychological Association called on mental health professionals to take the lead in removing the stigma of mental illness that has long been associated with homosexual orientation. Kim Mills, a representative of the Human Rights Campaign, a lesbian and gay political activist, said the resolution reaffirms the fact that since there is nothing wrong with homosexuality, there is no reason that gay, lesbian or bisexual people should try to change. 2. Roman Catholicism claims to have over 1 billion followers. 
Its decrees, although ignored by many of the less faithful Catholics, still carry substantial weight for the faithful Catholic. Catholic pronouncements have been softening their staunch position for many years. The Catholic Worker Paper of May 2001 reveals the stance of Roman Catholicism. Another issue that complicates discussion of homophobia is that the victims of this oppression are seen to have chosen their fate. Though some doubts do linger in the minds of many as to the origins of homosexuality, the Catechism of the Catholic Church states that homosexuality is innate, not chosen. 3. Sodomy has been redefined in order to remove any suggestion of choice. No longer is it a matter of what one prefers, sexual preference. Now, society claims that these poor sick souls cannot help themselves because sodomites are genetically predisposed, sexual orientation. In 1993, a geneticist from the National Cancer Institute claimed to have found a gay gene residing on a region of the maternally inherited X chromosome. His research was based on a finding that 33 of 40 pairs of gay brothers shared certain genetic markers not common between heterosexual brothers. To date, no one has been able to duplicate the results of this study. However, it is frequently cited as justification for a more lenient policy. Man has always, and will always, attempt to blame his sinful actions upon his creator. The Bible disagrees with the supposition that being a sodomite is not a matter of choice, unless you are using one of the modern versions produced with the help of known sodomites. Unsavory Associations Virginia Mollencott, a literary consultant for the NIV, worked on the translation the entire time it was being translated and reviewed. Although many examples can be given, one should suffice to prove her preference. This information is well documented in books and on the internet for all to read. In 1978, Virginia Mollencott co-authored, with Letha Skinzoni, a book entitled Is the Homosexual My Neighbor? in which she called for non-discrimination toward homosexuality. The book argues that the Sodom account in Genesis teaches not the evil of sodomy, but the evils of violent gang rape and inhospitality to strangers. Rewriting of History the book also claims that the idea of a lifelong homosexual orientation or condition is never mentioned in the Bible, page 71, and that Romans, chapter 1, does not fit the case of a sincere homosexual Christian, page 62. This is the exact position taken by one of the actual translators of the NIV, Dr. Martin H. Woodstra, in a report he assisted in producing for the Christian Reformed Church in 1973. It is also well reported that Dr. Woodstra, a bachelor all his life, believed that lifelong loving monogamous relationships between sodomite men or women were acceptable to God. He believed that there was nothing in the Old Testament, his special area of technical expertise, that addressed the homosexual orientation. He believed that the sodomy of the OT simply involved temple rites and gang rape. That is why the NIV reads as it does. Considering the influence on the modern versions exerted by individuals sympathetic to the perverted lifestyles, the NIV's complete removal of sodomy from its text it should come as no surprise. Of course, in doing so, the NIV attains one of its goals of becoming much more politically correct. Political and educational climates go hand in hand. Educators are attempting to convince our children at very early ages that the sodomite lifestyle is normal rather than aberrant. Two books, Daddy's Roommate and Heather Has Two Mommies, are prime examples of tools being used to lead youth down the path of degeneracy in society toward total moral decay. These books are intended for first and second graders. The former presents a young boy being raised by two sodomite men. The latter portrays a young girl being raised by two lesbians. Both groups are presented as happy, healthy, normal family environments. The sodomite agenda goes far beyond demanding tolerance. Instead, it seeks endorsement for its aberrant lifestyle. No more whores and sodomites. The Lord condemns the whore and the sodomite in the same scripture. He does this to show that there are two distinct groups involved in his rebuke, ensuring that they are not considered one and the same. KJB Deuteronomy 23 verse 17 There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Instead of highlighting the sin of sodomy, the NIV limits the context of this condemnation to those involved in the immorality of pagan religions. Read the modern versions which lack the convicting properties of the Word of God. Neve. 
Deuteronomy 23 verse 17 No Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. Is there any wonder why whores and sodomites have proclaimed their sexuality, marching in the streets of many major cities? When was the last time you saw or heard of a shrine prostitute? By including the word shrine in a translation that allegedly makes the Bible easier to understand, it further dilutes any convicting properties. So much for modernizing the lingo. The NIV replaces sodomite with prostitute in order to redefine the sin. With this change, the condemnation is limited only to the one who prostitutes, sells, his or her body. Those who are lovingly devoted to one partner are no longer condemned by the modern Bibles though that partner is of the same gender. Given the changes in this and other passages of the NIV, prostituting one's body is an abomination, while uncompensated whoredom and sodomy are not issues of moral concern. To readers of the NIV, the emphasis of the text concerns the crass commercial exploitations of these practices, rather than the practices themselves. The perversion itself is no longer the point of moral contention. Consider the number of years by which the NIV preceded today's politically correct environment, including hate crime legislation and the legal recognition and protection of sodomites. Remember that the NIV preceded today's wicked moral climate by decades. Who do you suppose knew the direction in which he was steering the world? 2. Corinthians 4 4 How has Satan been able to pull off these changes with hardly a whimper from many churches? Modern version perversions. Sodomites gone again. Today, if one lifts his voice against the sodomite, he is labeled as politically incorrect, bigoted, and homophobic. However, one that proclaims the truth is the true servant of God and should remain unconcerned about the voices contributing to society's moral decay through their abominable acts. The word of God points to the sodomite as being cast out of the land when Israel conquered it. The sodomites were those involved in the sin of sodomy modern-day homosexuals. God does not sound very understanding or open-minded, but definitely condemnatory. KJB 1 Kings 14 verse 24 And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Satan's ultimate plan of producing promiscuous societies began long before its results became evident. Satan has been leading the world down a gloomy path that looks deceptively bright to those unfamiliar with the truth. See the change? Neve. 1 Kings 14 verse 24 There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land, the people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. It is now considered a hate crime simply to voice God's warnings concerning sodomy. Preachers in some countries are being jailed for preaching the truth conveyed in the KJB. Schools are being told not to treat sodomy as sinful or unhealthy. They are attributing higher suicide rates among sodomites to the prejudice and discrimination against them rather than the remorse resulting from their sinful lifestyles. Yet, even apart from suicides, the life expectancy for sodomites remains much lower than those involved in healthy, God-ordained relationships. The fact is that sodomy brings an early grave. Today, hate crime legislation exists to protect a person's sexual orientation. The news media portrays sodomites as victims of violence and rarely as the perpetrators. When a sodomite is involved in a crime, sodomite activists do not want a parallel to be drawn between the crime and the perversion of the perpetrator. The sodomite knows that society's perception is very important. They cannot reproduce. They must recruit in order to perpetuate their practice. To do this most effectively, they must downplay the negative aspects of their deviant lifestyle and promote it as something perfectly natural, healthy, and normal. Unlike the modern versions, the King James Bible clearly and authoritatively condemns sodomy. Where are we headed? Without the absolute authority of God's word in society and culture, man tends to revert to his natural state that of abominable wickedness. Here are a few examples. In 1994, Governor William Weld of Massachusetts created the first ever Governor's Commission on Gay and Lesbian Youth. This state became the first state to pass into law a gay rights law for schools. The law required that all certified teachers and educators receive training in issues relevant to the needs and problems faced by gay and lesbian youth. Such training should be a requirement for teacher certification and school accreditation. 5. In 1996, the NEA, National Education Association, adopted as part of its bylaws Resolution B7. This resolution deals with racism, sexism, and sexual orientation discrimination. 
It calls for policies to eliminate all discrimination against gays and specific curricula to educate all age groups in public schools and the acceptance of sodomy. In 1998, the NEA, in conjunction with Washington State University, invited every high school and junior high school student in the state of Washington to participate in a three-day conference on sodomites. This conference was described as a kind of camp queer experience. 7. In March 2000, the Vermont House approved legislation allowing sodomites to form civil unions that would entitle them to be recognized as married couples. Among other benefits, this provision would then allow sodomite couples to file a joint state income tax return.8. In June 2001, delegates to the Presbyterian's National Assembly voted to abolish the church's ban on actively homosexual clergy and lay officers. This vote followed an open letter signed by a majority of Bible professors at Presbyterian seminaries 33 out of 58 urging the delegates to lift the ban. One professor fighting the ban said, Our context, in the 20th century, is so significantly different that I don't think the words of the Bible are any longer living, but dead words if we try to read them without contextually understanding them. It is important to understand the words contextually, but the true word of God is living and not dead. The professors summed up their arguments for lifting the ban in their letter. They stated that Bible passages about homosexuality should be understood for their meaning in their own time. On careful reading, the words of scripture seem to be advocating values such as hospitality to strangers, ritual purity, or the sinfulness of all human beings before God. The concept of homosexuality as now understood is probably not something the ancient biblical writers could have known. See 2 Timothy 3 verse 7. Man is obviously ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The article goes on to say, the church should honor the rule of love rather than pronouncing judgment upon a specific behavior of a whole category of persons. They claim that the Bible's overarching principles are inclusivity and justice, too. I wonder if the same rule of love philosophy applies to pedophiles, child molesters, who make up a whole category of persons with a specific behavior. It is really hypocritical to selectively apply these guidelines only to those who have convinced the politicians and medical community that their deviant, chosen lifestyle should be morally accepted and legally protected. These other aberrant groups will soon have their governmental legitimacy. 2. Final Thoughts now, read the remaining verse comparisons to discern from whence this wicked humanistic, rationalistic philosophy stems. God's Word, KJB, 1 Kings 15 verse 12 And he took away the sodomites out of the land. Satan's Tool, Neve, 1 Kings 15 verse 12 He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land. God's Word, KJB, 1 Kings 22 verse 46, and the remnant of the sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. Satan's device, Neve, 1 Kings 22 verse 46, he rid the land of the rest of the male shrine prostitutes who remained there even after the reign of his father Asa. God's word, KJB, 2 Kings 23 verse 7, and he break down the houses of the sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. Satan's Design, NIV, 2 Kings 23 verse 7, he also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes, which were in the temple of the Lord. Satan knows that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, Proverbs 14 verse 34. Satan knows that a powerful nation like the United States must crumble from within, because no outside force, apart from God, is sufficiently powerful to destroy it. When people change the truth of God into a lie and hold the truth in unrighteousness, God judges. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1 verse 18. America holds the truth in unrighteousness. The judgment is here and we are heading for it full steam ahead. Science proves that sodomy is dangerous. God requires a monogamous marital relationship between one man and one woman. This is the greatest protection against the spread of sexually transmitted diseases. It has been shown that sodomite activities shorten a person's lifespan by as much as 30 years. 10. Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Ecclesiastes 7 verse 17. The judgment of God abides upon the sodomite. 
Romans 1 verse 27 and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves, aids or grids, that recompense of their error which was meet. 28 and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The AIDS epidemic was originally given the acronym GRIDS Gay Related Immune Deficiency Syndrome. It has become the only politically protected disease, allowing it to reach pandemic and possibly epidemic proportions. Blaming the world for these sweeping changes is convenient. The root cause, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, for the lack of resolve to fight against this wickedness lies at the feet of Christians who accept the latest marketed Bible version as legitimate. Due to the modern version changes and resultant lack of understanding and conviction concerning this issue, Christians no longer have the resolve to fight against the homosexual agenda. According to a June 2001 article in the USA Today entitled Protestants Face Annual Sexual Divide, the following are the leading questions that must be addressed. Should gay clergy be ordained? Are same-sex unions blessed before God the same as the marriage of a man and woman? May a woman lead a church? The article goes on to say, American Protestantism can be a free-for-all when supposedly like-minded believers get together. These touchy topics may dominate or derail their agendas. 11. The one thing man learns from history is that he has failed to learn from history. God gave the Old Testament for our learning and admonition. However, many Christians are similar to Israel of old with a whore's forehead refusing to be ashamed. Jeremiah 3 verse 3 Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a whore's forehead, thou refused to be ashamed. As man accepts more and more wickedness, he no longer has the capacity to blush. Jeremiah 8 verse 12 Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush, therefore shall they fall among them that fall, in the time of their visitation they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Should these issues under consideration really be controversial? In today's immoral free-for-all, they are. The modern versions have played a big role in muddying the waters and creating the confusion. No longer are the absolutes taught because the underlying foundations have been destroyed. Society has become increasingly more permissive because the modern versions have eroded God's explicit guidelines. The divisions are caused by those who accept any version, not by those who believe God's principles are unchanging and absolute. It will only get worse unless we return to the one book that kept societies great and strong. Lenin knew more truth than many of the supposedly religious men of today. He said, destroy the family and the society will collapse. I would add, destroy the family and you destroy the church. Destroy the church and everything else follows. Mission accomplished through the modern version's contribution to the degradation of society. Antichrist's identity. As we have seen, Lucifer's identity has been hidden. See Isaiah 14 verse 12 comparison. The identity and character of the Antichrist has also been changed. The book of Daniel reveals that the Antichrist will be of Jewish descent, the god of his fathers, and indicates that he will most likely be a sodomite. KJB Daniel 11 verse 37 Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. The Antichrist will not regard, or want, the desire of women. Many Bible students believe this to mean that he will desire the attention of men exclusively. Does the NIV adequately identify Lucifer? No. Does the NIV adequately identify the Antichrist? No. NIV. Daniel 11 verse 37 He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. The KJB says he will have no regard for one god, he will be Jewish. 2. The desire of women, he will be a sodomite. 3. Any god, he will exalt himself as supreme. The NIV says he will have no regard for. 1. The gods of his fathers, undefined. 2. The one desired of women, unclear. 3. Any god, one out of three correct. The Antichrist's identity remains hidden along with his sexual preference for men. Or should I say his sexual orientation remains a mystery? 
who would most likely be the mastermind of such deception? These changes are not man-made, but Satan-inspired. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6 verse 12 Conclusion Romans chapter 1 has much to say about the subject matter of this chapter. The Bible warns those who change the truth of God into a lie that he will give them up to uncleanness. The context of this passage illustrates the extent of America's guilt. We have become wise in our own eyes, changing the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. KJB Romans 1 verse 25 Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Much of the intelligentsia appear to care more about a beached whale or a spotted owl, the creature, than about the God who created these creatures. God's word condemns this misplaced worship. The revisers have changed the truth into the opposite of the truth that is, into a lie. Having the truth and changing it is a far more serious offense to God than simply exchanging the truth for a lie created by others. The person who exchanges the truth for a lie may do so ignorantly. The person that changes the truth into a lie is the mastermind underlying the error. The NIV condemns the innocent. Neve. Romans 1 verse 25 They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Considering the full implications of this verse reveals a common ploy of the guilty party deflecting blame. Whereas the KJB condemns the perpetrator, the NIV condemns the victim. The modern versions no longer contain God's condemnatory remarks against those changing the truth of God into a lie. Those people who are busy changing the truth do not want to produce a Bible version that condemns their own actions. The modern versions attack the virgin birth, the deity of Jesus Christ, the blood atonement, the sinlessness of Christ, and many other doctrines. Those who exchange their King James Bible for one of these modern versions are condemned by the modern versions, while the real culprit the one actually changing the scripture stands condemned only by the KJB. Consider the difference between change and exchange. In recent decades, Bible changes have been made via small incremental alterations building up over time. After the initial onslaught, the changes have become increasingly pervasive. On the other hand, to exchange in this case refers to turning the Bible in for something false. If such wide-scale corruption were commonly known, it would shock most people into refusing it. For that reason, the devil changes the truth of God into a lie by gradually making the changes more palatable to the unsuspecting reader. If you have the truth, the King James Bible, and a modern version says something contrary to the KJB, what does that make the modern version? A lie. For purely lucrative reasons, specifically, the generation of millions of dollars annually, English Bible versions are produced. The only way to make money from Bible production is to qualify for a copyright. The only way to qualify for a new copyright is to make sufficient changes to an existing text. Since the same Bible publishers generally own copyrights on multiple versions, sales must be hijacked from the one book for which no one owns the copyright. That is why all the modern versions compare themselves with the King James Bible. It is the standard. The love of money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. If these groups were truly interested in disseminating the truth, they would direct their energies translating the Bible into languages currently lacking the Word of God. There are thousands of language groups worldwide who have no Bible, simply because monetary means are lacking in these areas. These publishers are concerned not with spreading truth, but with making money and gaining glory for themselves for their scholarly contributions to the supposed enlightenment of the masses. One Dennis Coral, Elements of a Godly Character, Claysburg, Pennsylvania, Revival Fires Publishers, 1996, page 61, 73. To the Montgomery Advertiser, Homosexuality Not a Disorder, experts say, Chicago Press Release, File Copy Date Unknown. 3 Catholic Worker Volume 68, No. 3 May 2001, 36 East 1st Street, New York, New York. For the Montgomery Advertiser, study offers challenge to gay Jean Washington press release, file copy date unknown. 5 Margay, Underwood, King James Bible Newsletter, October 1998, Volume 2, Issue 10, Page 3. 6 Ibid, Page 2. 7 Ibid, 
page 3. 8. The Montgomery Advertiser, Vermont House Approves Landmark Gay Rights Bill, March 17, 2000, P4A. 9. News and Record, Church Debates Homosexuality, Richard Osling, July 28, 2001, P.B. 7, B. 8. 10. Family Research Institute, Study Indicates Homosexual Acts Shorten Lifespan, Colorado Springs, Colorado. 11. USA Today, Protestants Face Annual Sexual Divide, June 6, 2001, pages 19 to 20. 8. The Monetary Motive. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Titus 1 verses 10 to 11. As each new and now best Bible translation emerges on the market, Bible publishers hope and pray to capture a generous chunk of the $400 million dollar American Bible market. Unfortunately for modern version readers, money does seem to be the Bible reviser's primary motive. If the Bible reviser's motives were simply to assist customers in better understanding God's word, then the warning against religious fervor for money would not be so obscured. You too may begin to wonder whether these alterations are intentional acts of deception rather than innocent acts of revisionism. Regardless of their intentions surrounding such changes, the fact remains that the revisers are guilty of making them. It is often said that how a person handles money reveals a great deal about his or her character. This fact holds true with regard to the modern versions as well. The character of these versions can be discerned from carefully studying their treatment of monetary matters. The deceitfulness of riches. As the Lord began to teach, great multitudes flocked to hear his words. The parable of the sower remains a favorite of many Bible students. After finishing with the multitudes, the Lord then retreated to spend some quality time teaching his 12 disciples. During these special moments, the disciples took opportunities to ask him questions including the meaning of this particular parable. Jesus explained that the seeds sown among the thorns represent individuals who hear the word yet remain distracted by the cares of this world. He referred specifically to the deceitfulness of riches. KJB, Mark 4 verse 19, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Mark chapter 4 from the KJB reveals that riches can be deceitful. This Pasag explicitly warns of the deceitful nature of trusting in riches. Notice how the Revised Standard Version changes God's negative statement concerning money into something vague and confusing. RSV Mark 4 verse 19 But the cares of the world, and the delight in riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Take note that one can be deceived by riches without finding any delight in his wealth. In fact, an endless list exists of those who have accumulated vast sums of money, yet found no real delight in the money. The accumulation of wealth, rather than its enjoyment, became their top priority. The problem with people overtaken by the accumulation of wealth is their failure to realize how deceived they are by the very thing they so greatly desire. Amschkel Rothschild is a primary example of a man deceived by riches who evidently found little delight in them. His story ends when he hanged himself in a luxury hotel in Paris at the age of 41. He was the man anticipated to assume control of the British merchant bank in M. Rothschild & Sons, a private company with $800 million in sales and 2,800 employees. Instead, a cleaning lady at the Hotel Bristol discovered his lifeless body. He could certainly testify of the deceitfulness of riches now. The Root of All Evil The first comparison dealt with the now-defunct 1952 Revised Standard Version. The remaining comparisons regarding money illustrate that the NIV clearly follows the lead of its 1952 predecessor. God and His Word offer absolutes involving every facet of life. This truth holds true especially as it applies to money. 1 Timothy offers the most explicit biblical warning concerning money. Satan hates all truth. In this case, he does not want man to be warned concerning the dire consequences associated with the love of money. KJB 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. At first glance, it is obvious that God has no problem using absolute terminology. In fact, he says that the love of money is the root of all evil. How can God be so dogmatic? How can God make such a bold claim? Romans 9 verse 20. 
The modern versions and their authors seem to find difficulty in admitting the truth concerning money. If the real purpose of the modern Bibles is simply to update God's words using current language, then these newer versions should still agree with the Bible version our founding fathers used to create the American system of government, Isaiah 33 verse 22. However, the King James Bible and the modern versions do not agree. Clearly, both cannot be correct. Neve. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. If God says that the love of money is the root of all evil, then it is not a root of all kinds of evil, as the modern versions teach. Man straddles the fence and so do the modern versions. God wants Christians to choose a side, Joshua 24 verse 15. The Lord despises those who choose to sit on the fence with a lukewarm attitude toward everything, Revelation 3 verse 16. The apparent driving force behind the production of these modern versions is money and the overwhelming desire, love, for its accumulation. Therefore, the result of every sin caused by these modern versions, as well as their failure to dispense the truth, can be attributed to the love of money. The reason we have hundreds of versions to choose from is that the publishers and backers of the modern versions are all trying to gain a share of this lucrative market. There are 400 million reasons, dollar, why this is true. The following is one illustration of how the love of money is the root of all evil. Chapter 6 Discuss the differences in God's expectations versus the modern version's lowered moral standards. The King James Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22. The New International Version changes this truth to avoid every kind of evil. The meaning of these two passages differs considerably. They are not even close in meaning. The King James Bible conveys a much higher moral standard and loftier spiritual expectations. For example, the command from the KJB concerning abstaining from things that may appear evil might persuade the reader to limit the time spent alone with someone of the opposite sex. The reason to abstain from this situation is not because it is evil, but because it has the appearance of evil and these situations have led to far too many truly evil outcomes. A man and woman spending time alone together though not married to each other is not necessarily evil. However, the preacher without the KJB misses the clear warning from scripture to abstain from these things because of their adverse appearance. A modern version, such as the NIV, does not warn to abstain from all appearance of evil. The reader is only told to avoid every kind of evil, therefore, he knows it is not necessarily evil to be alone with a woman, so he might never consider God's warnings. These kinds of situations could have been completely avoided before they progressed rapidly beyond repair, had the modern versions contained the whole counsel of God. There have been many pastors, and employers, in general, who have run off with their secretaries and employees because their chosen version lacks the scriptural admonition. How does God's statement concerning the love of money as the root apply to this pastor's evil in the previous situation? The logic is very simple to follow. The modern perversions have been hitting the market at lightning speed with an underlying money-making motive. Any pastor who reads only the NIV is not admonished by the NIV to abstain from the appearance of evil ending up with a more serious problem as he becomes involved emotionally and then physically with his secretary. The modern versions do not warn anyone to abstain from the appearance of evil. Their money-making motive for producing another Bible causes men and women to miss clear warnings from God, which the Word of God, the KJB, has been giving for hundreds of years. Therefore, the reviser's love of money is the root of this evil and all other evil resulting from this one act, and all similar acts. The love of money is the root of all evil. Copywriting Bibles If these Bible revisers' motives are pure, why do they place a financial copyright upon the Word of God? The reason they copyright their respective versions is to gain the royalties associated with them. They, not God, wrote. The words of these translations, why should they not want to profit from them? In contrast, the Apostle Paul tells us to pray that the word of the Lord may have free course, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12. The copyright makes it illegal to copy a modern scripture version without obtaining permission from its publisher. Reference the definition of copyright found in the New Standard Encyclopedia, Volume 3, page 565, the legal protection given to authors and artists to prevent reproduction of their work without their consent. 
The owner of a copyright has the exclusive right to print, publish, copy and sell the material covered by the copyright. The mass copywriting of these versions by Bible societies and corporations should signal that these are the words of men and not the words of God, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. The following incident further illustrates this point considering the lucrative Bible market. When Bible study computer programs first became popular, I found one program that I particularly liked. I called the designer of this program in Ontario, Canada and asked him about adding another version to it. I wanted to be able to easily compare the NIV with the KJB so that I could easily show others the NIV's contradictions. He said he could not afford to pay the royalties for adding the NIV to his program. How much did they want in royalties for him to include the NIV in his program? $5,000. Writing and printing these modern versions is a money-making business and has caused immeasurable evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. The modern version texts are copyrighted, allowing only a prescribed number of verses to be quoted and or reprinted without express written permission of the publisher. The copyright page of the 1973 and 1978 NIV limited the number of verses to 100. The 1984 version printed by the International Bible Society changed the number to 500. The NIV text may be quoted in any form, written, visual, electronic, or audio, up to and inclusive of 500, 500 verses without express written permission of the publisher. However, Zondervan also printed a 1984 version allowing 1,000 verses to be used without permission. Obviously, the financial incentives to control the usage of this translation were much greater during its early life. One book stands alone without a financial copyright. The King James Bible may be freely copied, printed, or published without permission. The notes and formatting within the printed pages of King James Study Bibles are copyrighted. The text has no copyright. However, the privilege of printing Bibles in England has belonged to the royal printer since the mid-1500s. Upon publication of the authorized version, King James I of England assigned to that work a cum privilegio, meaning with privilege, in the name of the crown. The Cambridge and Oxford Bibles, printed only in England, contain cum privilegio on their title pages. This measure has protected the integrity of the text from those producing King James Bibles containing altered text. No such protection exists in the United States, where KJB imposters such as the new Schofield versions have arisen. In England, the responsibility of printing the Bible has always been considered to be too important to entrust to anyone other than the king and those appointed by him to do the printing. Today, all Bibles printed in England are printed by the university presses of Cambridge and Oxford. Considering the spelling changes made within the King James text, whether inadvertently or intentionally, by Thomas Nelson and Zondervan publishers, it is a shame that the same standards have not been incorporated in countries outside of England in order to protect the text from the unscrupulous. The Cambridge and Oxford Bibles are some of the best quality, material, and most trusted, typographically. One need not be concerned about their altering the text yet. Peddling the word. The revisers justify their changes by saying the oldest and best manuscripts say something different from the King James Bible. Paul negated this argument long before any of these Bible perverters ever invented this scheme. During the first century, Paul made note of the many people who were corrupting the word of God. Even as Paul penned the scripture, these scribes were doing their dirty work. KJB 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 For we are not as many, which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. It seems that the NIV editors want Christians to remain ignorant of the far-reaching effect of Satan's hand. These Bible producers do not want believers to know that corruption began as the word of God was being penned. The biblical account of the Garden of Eden shows that Satan's plan of corruption was placed into action soon after the creation of man, Genesis 3 verse 1. While corrupting the word of God and selling it for a profit, these Bible editors have the audacity to change the word corrupt to peddle in the modern versions. They are truly guilty of changing the truth of God into a lie. Neve. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Those who are peddling the word of God hide their involvement in its corruption. 
In doing so, they make themselves guilty of both the sin of corruption and the sin of hypocrisy by peddling it. Hitler once said, if you tell a lie enough times, people will believe it as truth. The NIV editors not only corrupt the truth, but also change the truth of God into a lie. Romans 1 verse 25. This perversion of truth did not begin after the invention of the printing press. Jeremiah told the religious leaders of his day, for ye have perverted the words of the living God. Jeremiah 23 verse 36. Solomon said, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. These modern version publishers simply duplicate the act of Satan in the garden, certainly nothing new. By changing the scripture from corrupt to peddle, the modern versions also inadvertently attack every bookstore selling Bibles, KJB, and Bibles for a profit. Obviously, a bookstore could not stay in business very long without making a profit from their sales. Nevertheless, the NIV condemns this practice. Supposing that gain is godliness. The New York Bible Society, now known as the International Bible Society, copyrighted the NIV text in 1973. Their copyright provides that this group is in fact peddling the word of God for profit. They may point to all the copies they sell as proof of God's blessings. However, the Bible clearly warns us to withdraw from those who believe that profitability denotes spirituality. KJB 1 Timothy 6 verse 4 He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, five perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. The word of God warns Christians to withdraw from those who teach gain is godliness. In other words, withdraw yourself from any ministry or person who points to possessions, in the form of money, buildings, or numbers, as proof positive of a godly ministry. One simply cannot look at the outward appearance to determine the truth of the matter. Because of the politically correct unity at all costs, the NIV fails to warn its readers to withdraw fellowship from unscriptural associations. In fact, the NIV actually reverses God's explicit warning. NIV 1 Timothy 6 verse 4 He is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions 5 and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Contrary to the NIV's assertion, living a godly life should be the only means to financial gain. Claiming otherwise encourages godless acts in order to become wealthy. This is the modus operandi of the NIV. If everyone believed that living godly was the only way to true financial success, the whole economic and financial landscape would transform overnight. Shame on the NIV editors for rebuking right thinking and godly living. If the modern revisers' motives are not as wrong as they appear, the results of their handiwork certainly are. Motives are important. The King James Bible rebukes the motives of those teaching false doctrine. Although not a sin to take wages for one's ministry, preachers of the gospel are not to be motivated by any potential for financial benefits resulting from the ministry. Serving the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than earning money, is to be one's motive for ministry. KJB Titus 1 verse 10 For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, eleven whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. In this scenario, the KJB refers to the money as filthy lucre, money, because of the motives linked to it. The individuals referred to in this passage are teaching false doctrine for the sake of money. The emphasis in the NIV changes from a rebuke against teaching for financial gain to a rebuke for being dishonest about doing so. Neve. Titus 1 verse 10 For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. 11 They must be silenced, because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. The NIV's rebuke is against dishonest gain, rather than a general rebuke against those teaching falsely for the sake of money. 
If a person teaches false doctrine and does so in a sincere, honest fashion, he might experience no conviction from reading the NIV even if his motive is based on money, contrary to the true word of God. In other words, such an individual might consider his unscriptural motives sufficient since he has no absolute standard of truth as a means of convicting him. Many of these modern version publishers claim otherwise, but air motives remind me of a letter once writ by a college student with his motives somewhat camouflaged. See if you can read between the lines. Dear Dad, Dollar Cole is really great. I am making lot dollar of friend dollar and dollar tooting very hard. With all my dollar tough, I dollar imply can't think of anything I need. Dollar o if you would like, you can do dollar t dollar end me a card, a dollar I would love to hear from you. Love, your dollar on. Concerning the purchasing of these modern Bibles, we should take a hint from the father's letter back to his son concerning the veiled request for money. Dear son, I know that astronomy, economics, and oceanography are enough to keep even an honor student busy. Do not forget that the pursuit of knowledge is a noble task, and you can never study enough. Love, Dad. The endless parade of modern versions will not end until the Lord returns. The financial incentives seem far too great for many sinful men to obediently resist. Dr. William P. Grady, in his book Final Authority, quotes from Jack Lewis who aptly, and probably inadvertently, pointed out the insanity behind the modern version mania. If one should ask if there are too many translations, the reply must be that the question is really irrelevant. The translations are here, they are not going away, and they must be dealt with. To hide one's head in the sand will not make the translations disappear, it will not bring back the so-called good old days when everyone read one translation. As long as there is financial gain in it, publishers will push translations, old or new point one. Of course, the word of God reveals the true motive, too, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. Think about the changes made by the modern versions. Why are they made if not to express a particular viewpoint? Figure out the angle of the changes, and they will clearly reveal the motives of the revisers. 1 Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit page 298 9 how shall they preach what is the chief end of preaching i like to think it is to give men and women a sense of god and his presence i can forgive the preacher almost anything if he gives me a sense of god if he gives me something for my soul if he gives me the sense that though he is inadequate himself he is handling something which is very great and very glorious one martin lloyd jones New Bible version producers claim to be making the Word of God easier to understand. Why then does each of these new translations diminish the importance of preaching the Word of God? Keep in mind two contrasting positions as we cover the topic of preaching. First, God elevates preaching. Second, Satan despises God-ordained preaching. This is why the Lord commends those who preach the gospel while Satan mounts his fiercest attack against these same men. Be careful if your chosen Bible version diminishes the importance of preaching. God commends preaching. God did not choose man's wisdom to convey his truth to the world. In fact, he chose the opposite of the world's expectations. He chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 God purposefully chooses a foolish practice to confound the wise. The Lord even uses one of the most uncomely parts of the body, the feet, to commend the preaching of the gospel. KJB Romans 10 verse 15 And how shall they preach, except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. God exalts the act of preaching his holy word, thus, any version not exalting this God-ordained medium for proclaiming truth is one of Satan's devices, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11. Pastors must be ever conscious of Satan's attempts to destroy that which God exalts. Does the NIV follow the KJB's lead by promoting the preaching of the gospel? Neve. Romans 10 verse 15 And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This statum from the NIV conveys something totally foreign the true text. Omion who brings good news does not necessarily convey or even suggest the preaching of the gospel. God describes as beautiful only those who obediently preach the gospel. Delivering good news covers a wide variety of activities, which may include the preaching of the gospel. 
However, preaching is not necessarily the first activity that comes to mind when you think of someone bringing good news. This may be hard to fathom in most churches today, but Martin Lloyd-Jones expressed man's highest calling as that of preaching. The work of preaching is the highest and the greatest and the most glorious calling to which anyone can ever be called. Two Mr. Jones continued by pinpointing, over four decades ago, society's shifting opinion and the primary cause for preaching's demise. I would not hesitate to put in the first position, the loss of belief in the authority of the scriptures and the diminution in the belief of the truth. I put this first because I am sure it is the main factor. He then clearly identified man's ever-increasing dilemma. While men believed in the scriptures as the authoritative word of God and spoke on the basis of that authority you had great preaching. 3. The following point is easily extrapolated from his thoughts. We no longer have much great preaching or many great preachers due to the overt attack upon God's word and those attempting to preach from something that is neither believed nor reverenced. This is simply 21st century spiritual infidelity. Preaching establishes the believer. Many churches have replaced the preaching of God's word and his gospel with every conceivable program and gimmick. Absolutely nothing should supplant the preeminence of preaching. It is the only means to establish a Christian in the faith. As the devil continues to blind people to this truth, he gains ever more ground amongst believers. Unfortunately for those attending churches that have tired of preaching, these people never come to recognize God's true purpose and plan for their lives. God chooses preaching to establish Christians in the faith. KJB Romans 16 verse 25 Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. When a man preaches Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery revealed in the church age epistles, the Christian can be established in the faith. The NIV again conceals this truth by eliminating the preeminence of preaching. Satan hates preaching, as do the editors of the NIV. NIV. Romans 16 verse 25 Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. The world loves the modern versions because Holy Ghost conviction from reading them is reduced and sometimes eliminated. The Bible commands the preaching of God's word. Furthermore, it commands that we not be guilty of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, primarily through preaching and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching, Hebrews 10 verse 25. In our busy society, church has become far too inconvenient, and skipping church, far too convenient. The Bible says that when we fail to gather, we are forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As a result of the influence of these modern versions, people want to hear someone share, rather than to listen and respond to soul-convicting preaching. Churches need to return to good, old-fashioned, soul-stirring, Holy Ghost preaching. Churches do not need to become social clubs, devoid of spiritually vital preaching. Many examples of such ecclesiastical social clubs exist throughout the United States, but Northridge Church is a great case in point. Temple Baptist Church, located just outside Detroit, Michigan, is a church with a rich history. It was founded by J. Frank Norris and later pastored by G. Beecham Vick. Dr. Norris actually traveled between Texas and Michigan and pastored two churches simultaneously. A flyer sent out by Temple Baptist, now called Northridge Church, belittled preaching by proclaiming the 101 reasons people skip church. Number 54 was because of the Terminator, an offshoot from Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator image. The advertisement for this modern, up-to-date church further proclaimed, if your idea of a pastor is the Bible-thumping, finger-pointing, hellfire-preaching variety, then think again. At Northage Church, you'll discover there's something for everyone. The first on the list of six items is relevant talks. According to the flyer, Northridge's senior pastor, Brad Powell is sharing talks through November called Free to Choose. How could a church move so far away from its rich heritage? The answer is very simple. Once modern versions displace the King James Bible, these modern version pseudo-churches replace preaching with every conceivable program using every conceivable gimmick. The ultimate objective of these organizations, increase numbers. Not surprisingly, the same flyer made mention of energized music most likely referring to the non-existent Christian rock. Their statement of beliefs can be found on their website at www.northridgechurch.com under 
the heading what we believe you will find another heading entitled Bible Beliefs. As I pressed the button, I expected to find their position on the Bible. Instead, three paragraphs appeared. The first sentence in each paragraph reads as follows. 1. Essential beliefs we believe there should be unity. In this section, they quote portions of Ephesians 4 verses 4 to 6 from the NIV. Note, unity must never be a goal to achieve at the expense of the truth. 2. Non-essential beliefs, we believe there should be liberty. They quote Romans 14 verses 1 and 4, 12, and 22 from the NIV, conveniently leaving verse 22 off of the list of verses included in their quote and only quoting one half of the verse. Here is the skipped section from the NIV, Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves, Romans 14, 22b NIV. Satan's temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 included scriptures quoted in part and out of context, too. For instance, compare Matthew 4 verse 6 with Psalm 91 verses 11 to 13. Matthew records the fact that the devil quotes verses 11 and 12 from Psalm 91, but omits verse 13 which reads, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. The part Satan omitted foretells of his demise. Go back and read. The part of the verse omitted in the statement by Northridge. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. 3. In all our beliefs we believe that we must maintain love toward each other. Again quoting from the NIV. This time they use 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2. Note, the King James Bible uses the word charity referring to something far greater than love. Society has redefined charity by limiting the definition to the giving of our possessions to the needy. However, Bible-defined charity is far greater than love. Shamefully, most of us lack the capacity to understand the true concept of charity in the sin-sick, hardened world. The Northridge webmaster or the pastor chose his quotes from the NIV, reduced preaching to relevant talks, and emphasized unity, liberty, love and teaching rather than Bible doctrines. Incorporating unity, liberty, and love into our churches is very important but never at the truth's expense. Returning our thoughts back to historic Bible preaching in days gone by, Martin Lloyd-Jones again gives us a fresh perspective on preaching. Is it not clear, as you take a bird's eye view of church history, that the decadent periods and eras in the history of the church have always been those periods when preaching had declined? What is it that always heralds the dawn of a reformation or of a revival? It is renewed preaching. So my answer so far, my justification of my statement that preaching is the primary task of the church is based in that way on the evidence of the scriptures and the supporting and confirming evidence of the history of the church. Point four. Any true definition of preaching must say that that man is there to deliver the message of God, a message from God to those people. He is an ambassador for Christ. He is standing there as the mouthpiece of God and of Christ to address these people. In other words, he is not there merely to talk to them, he is not there to entertain them. Preaching should make such a difference to a man who is listening that he is never the same again. 5. Amen. How does your current perception of preaching align itself with God's true definition of preaching? Today's choice revolves between modern contemporary relevant talks by hirelings versus Bible-based sermons by spirit-filled men of God. The astonishing word. Preeminence allotted to any activity other than the preaching of the word of God diminishes the main purpose for assembling together. Today, churches allow many things, including musical performances, to replace the time formerly allotted to preaching. If the pastor allows this to regularly take place, carnality increases. Christians need the preaching of God's word to get and stay right with him because God's word has power. KJB Luke 4 verse 32 And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. As we have seen, the modern versions emphasize the message rather than preaching. They also change the word found in Luke chapter 4 by placing the emphasis upon the message. Satan knows that he cannot completely destroy the truth, therefore, he deviously supplants it with every conceivable Bible variation. He then convinces the multitudes that there is no difference among the various Bibles and the King James Bible. Even James White's book, which shamelessly attacks the King James Bible, admits that the modern versions are based upon a different set of manuscripts. He wrote, the textual differences between the KJV and the modern versions derived from the Hebrew and Greek texts from which they were translated. 
These self-proclaimed scholars have convinced themselves and others that we no longer have God's word, therefore, the message takes on greater significance than the literal words of God. Neve. Luke 4 verse 32 They were amazed at his teaching, because his message had authority. These changes are far more significant than one might initially realize. The word gives the message authority, and the message has no authority apart from God's word. As men elevate the message over the word, they likewise unscripturally elevate the messenger. Therefore, man must discredit the authority of the word to give the message and the messenger the world's desired preeminence. Preach Doctrine All scripture is profitable. God's word points out that the scripture is first and foremost profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is dogmatic. One must never waver on the doctrines from God's word. KJB 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. A man may teach anything, but the doctrines of God are unchanging and eternal. God's doctrines come from the scriptures. They are the very words of God. This passage from the NIV diminishes the importance of God's doctrines by again elevating teaching. As the modern version elevates teaching over doctrine, man likewise unscripturally elevates the teacher over the giver of life. Neve. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. When the NIV says that the scripture is useful for teaching, it simply restates the obvious. However, when the Bible mentions doctrine, this means something much more concrete than teaching alone. Doctrine is something that is accepted as authoritatively true and indisputable. Doctrine is dogmatic truth. True Christianity is dogmatic concerning the fact that there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4 verse 12. This is the doctrine of salvation. A man's teachings do not carry the same weight of authority as God's doctrines. Satan hates God's doctrines and will use every means available, including the modern versions, to diminish the importance of Bible doctrines. Pray that the word has free course. It is the word that gives authority to the message. Paul's recorded prayer request for the Thessalonians elevates the word. God desires for his word to have free course and be glorified. KJB 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1 Finally, brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. The NIV again misplaces the emphasis. Once again, word is changed to message. The carnal assembly of today is most concerned with increasing its numbers. For this reason, the emphasis is placed on the speed of finishing a message, rather than on the word being unhindered and having free course. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18 Neve 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1 Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you. The NIV sounds more like a disease it is spreading rapidly. The mushroom growth of the contemporary unscriptural churches shows how the message of the NIV has spread rapidly. In its wake arise organizations like Northridge, the word saves. The priests and the Sadducees were grieved that Peter and some of the other apostles taught the people and preached the resurrection from the dead. Therefore, these religious leaders arrested them and put them in prison. However, many of them, which heard the word, believed and were saved. KJB Acts 4 verse 4 Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Again, the emphasis in the King James Bible is upon the word of God. People are saved by the word, not some man-made three-point outline. The message must always originate from the word, elevate the word, and preach the word. Can you find the misplaced emphasis in this passage from the NIV? Neve Acts 4 verse 4 But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Satan wants to artificially elevate man to God's rightful place, while ensuring that God and his word are cheapened. What is important? If the message is supreme, the messenger is most important. If the word is supreme, its author is most important. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Romans 3 verse 4 as a vessel, man needs to take God's word and pray that God gives it free course so that Satan does not reign victorious. When God's word is elevated, the messenger becomes less significant. John aptly said, He must increase, but I must decrease. John 3 verse 30 
We need to be submissive empty vessels meet for the master's use. 2 Timothy 2 verse 21 Calvin Linton, an NIV editor, said the Bible is God's message and not his words. He calls Christians amusingly uninformed who presume the Holy Spirit dictated the actual words of the text of the original writers. 7. With this type of condescending attitude toward God's holy word, no wonder seminaries have become breeding grounds for every type of error and heresy. I wonder what Mr. Linton will think when he stands before the dictator of the word. Matthew 5 verse 18 For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. According to Webster's 1828 dictionary, the definitions of jot and tittle are very simple. J-O-T, N, heb, yod, an iota, a point, a tittle, the least quantity assignable. T-I-T-T-L-E, N, from tit, small, a small particle, a minute part, a jot, an iota. God promises that not one iota, point, or minute part of the law will fall by the wayside. This passage is frequently applied to preservation incorrectly. God's promise of preservation always refers to the words of God, not the punctuation or even the spelling. This is not to say that the spelling is unimportant. However, every verse concerning preservation refers to the words of God. God does not care what man thinks. In fact, his thoughts are far above our thoughts. Where man envisions the impossibilities, God sees the victories. Isaiah 55 verse 7 Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 8 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 9 For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We are responsible for lining up our thoughts as close as possible with those of the Lord. We need to be more spiritually minded, and the only way to achieve this lofty goal is to constantly saturate our thoughts with His true word. Some concluding thoughts concerning preaching. Preaching is that which deals with the total person. The hearer becomes involved and knows that he has been dealt with and addressed by God through this preacher. Oh, to experience more of that type of preaching today. How can one expect to attain this lofty goal if he does not even have God's word? Jeremiah 23 verse 28. This type of preaching is unattainable without God's word to guide and direct the preacher and hearer. Satan knows this. One reason many preachers are shying away from preaching is because true preaching has power. If there is no power, it is not preaching. True preaching, after all, is God acting. It is not just a man uttering words, it is God using him, since God is on the outside of many of these churches knocking on the door, it would be a misnomer to call the activity from the stage, preaching point two. The world needed this type of preaching 100 years ago. It needs the same type of preaching today. The world needed churches busy preaching God's word in decades gone by. The world needs churches busy preaching God's word today. God's word, excluding the modern versions, has not changed in nearly 2,000 years. These modern versions have corrupted the truth and have caused many people to err from the faith. Shamefully, Christians have been very slow to respond to the obvious problems associated with these modern versions. The Bible believer cannot take this rejection personally. What if a man rejects God's warnings concerning his infallible word? God reveals his thoughts concerning this man, too. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 38 Some people consider the New King James Version as an acceptable alternative to the King James Bible. For this reason, the NKJV is the most insidious of all of the translations on the market. Unfortunately, many KJB users have been duped by Thomas Nelson's effective marketing. The next few chapters reveal how this Hollywood-type sales pitch has cleverly turned the truth of God into a lie. 1D Martin Lloyd-Jones, Preaching and Preachers, Zondervan, Grand Rapids, Michigan, 1972, page 97, 98. 2 Ibid, page 9. 3 Ibid, page 13. 4 Ibid, page 24, 25. 5 Ibid, page 53. 6 White, the King James Only Controversy, Op. Sit, page 28. 7. Kenneth L. Barker, The NIV, The Making of a Contemporary Translation, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Zondervan Publishing House, 1986, pages 17 to 19. 8. Jones, Preaching and Preachers, Op. Sit, 
page 56, 9 Ibid, page 95.